Hey everyone, I am Nicole Forbes with Dennis's 70s and today we're talking about gardening of to-dos and not to-dos. Um, the kind of top title I gave this was to rake or not to rake, which of course kind of goes along with if you're on um, you know, social media, which I know you are because you're watching on Facebook right now, uh, you'll have been seeing a lot of uh, articles and posts on leave the leaves and the Xeris, uh, Xerxes Society, the Wildlife Federation, uh, a lot of kind of our, you know, local conservation and uh, wildlife groups have really been working hard over the last couple of years to get that message out there to um, leave the leaves, to not rake and blow and collect and bag up and send all of your uh, fallen leaves to yard debris collection, for example, and instead leave them on site. Now, any kind of uh, social media campaign that basically tells you that you can skip some chores is bound to go viral and get a lot of traction. So I'm sure at this point you have taken all of that into consideration and put all your rakes away and just basically decided that you know, gardening is over and let's let nature take its course this year. If that has been kind of your reaction, um, we do want to temper the simple yet catchy phrase of leave the leaves with a little bit more detailed information um, and kind of just, you know, a general discussion of what should one be doing out in the garden this time of year. As uh, usual, if you have attended a class uh, and, or, or watched a class video, there's a, a document, a handout that will give you some of the detailed information that I'll be talking through. Uh, it's in the, uh, it's just below the description or the title of this video. So you'll see a, a hyperlink to it. If you can't find the, video or the content, put in a comment in the comment section and we'll make sure to just link the attachment to you directly. Now, when we start talking about what to do at this time of year in the garden or what not to do, uh, there's still time to do a lot of planting. And the planting that you do at this time of year isn't exactly going to um, result in a lot of immediate growth or immediate satisfaction. It is definitely a delayed uh, and, you know, delayed result that we get in most cases from things in the fall. The delayed result, though, um, pays off by the following season when, as, you know, summer comes, for example, the perennials that we put in this time, you know, or divided or whatever, planting this time of year, have a, a longer time to establish and root in before it gets hot and dry next summer, as opposed to planting or dividing or digging things and moving things next spring. So there's still time to plant uh, perennials, trees, shrubs, certainly through the end of the month of November, you are absolutely safe and uh, will take advantage of warm soil conditions to grow nice roots. The other items that can be planted this time of year and will begin to reward you spring and one of those is bulbs. So of course uh, October is kind of typically the best month for planting bulbs but we have combination or single packs of tulips, daffodils. This is tulips, hyacinths, and crocus. Uh, this is a really fun combination I use in containers a lot at home. <clears throat> so bulb planting this time of year we will have those flowers come up next spring anywhere from early spring to uh, mid spring or even late spring which could be as late as May in some cases for late blooming tulips. Also garlic. In your edible garden, garlic is a great thing to plant at this time of year to give us uh, garlic harvest in May or even June, possibly July again for the late harvest varieties. You may be harvesting your garlic in July next year but from a single head of you plant each individual clove and then each clove will make its own head. So you get quite a bit of garlic from, you know, just one head of garlic and the flavor range that's available 
for garlic is really quite profound if you have only tasted the garlic that you have access to in the store um, i highly recommend trying some different types of garlic that are really just available by putting them in your own backyard garden speaking of your backyard garden another great thing to do at this time of year is sow cover crop which is a seed that is inexpensive a little bit of cover crop goes a long ways. We sell it in bulk, so you just buy it by a pound. And cover crops uh, germinate in cool weather, so they come up easily this time of year, right in the soil, no special uh, preparation or you know heat blankets or lights or anything like that. So you scatter it on your garden this time of year, and the cover crop grows through the fall and winter months. And when you are preparing to sow your garden again next spring, you'll take the two to three weeks before you want to plant your garden and flip over the living plant that was the cover crop. So for example, crimson clover, which is a great cover crop as a legume. Uh, so it nitrogen fixes in the soil that grows. Also then has a beautiful flower. You can check that uh, 15, 18 inch, even 20 inch tall, plant, chop it at the ground and flip over the root mass and let it decompose in the soil. It takes a couple of weeks. So that's why you go two to three weeks before you intend on planting your, you know, tomatoes or your carrots or whatever for next season. Cover crops not only re-nourish the soil, but they're a great competition plant for weeds and weed seeds, which I guarantee if you just leave your garden empty, you're going to have a lot of weed seeds that have grown in it over the fall and winter. And by spring, you, you're gonna have to weed the garden before you replant. <clears throat> so compete with weeds, nourish the soil, and just as green matter growing above the soil itself, it reduces the compaction of just, you know, pounding rain uh, that happens over and winter months so it protects the soil from erosion and compaction as well as you know just giving you something nice to look at of you know empty garden beds and it's really just a couple of dollars and a very easy scatter activity <clears throat> so things that you can still do this time of year and the last thing that i encourage people to start doing now that the rains have returned here in the portland area we have mild cool but mild temperatures it really hasn't gotten terribly chilly yet but we've got our rain coming back and that is the perfect opportunity for snakes and snails to come slithering and slinking out of their little holes and hidey spots that they've been hanging out through the hot dry summer in most cases slugs have gone probably into some sort of like hibernation or dormancy when it was too hot and dry for them and now they're out and it, you know, like a bear that wakes up in the winter or, you know, wakes up from its winter rest, slugs that have been dormant are probably ravenously hungry. And so all of the little tender greens in your garden, tiny little shoots of things that are growing at this time of year are easy meals for slugs and snails. They also will take the opportunity at this time of year to do some fall reproduction and there then they lay eggs in the soil that will kind of um you know emerge as young slugs or snails as the weather warms up either in late winter or early spring so doing slug control at this time of year not only can help to protect young tiny shoots if you've got a vegetable garden that's newly planted but it can also reduce uh, like spring population that you have just by kind of slowing that fall reproduction um, and targeting the population now. Now we have products like Sluggo or Slug Magic here which are pet and wildlife safe. They are pelletized so they're pretty rain safe. We reapply them about every three or four weeks in the garden and uh, it's very uh, lightly scattered. <clears throat> um, so I use it as a perimeter uh, bait so I kind of use it around the outer edges usually of my edible garden uh, rather than just tossing it directly into where the plant is this is a four pound this is a three pound container 
and covers 3,000 square feet. So this could, in most cases, you know, do repeated applications of your whatever, you know, 100 square foot garden or however, whatever size your garden is. So uh, a little bit goes a long ways. Slug control also is good in a good idea in containers. And really, I would suggest going out. So what are we in or early November? So scatter some now, scatter some right around Thanksgiving. And then usually we get a killing frost sometime right. Then. And in most cases, when it's super cold out, the slugs go back into like little crevices between like the dirt and the side of your raised beds, or they find little kind of holes and nooks and crannies in the soil uh, or in areas where they can hide and stay warmer. And in most cases, they're not doing a ton of feeding at that time of year. So you can pause the slug bait while it is cold, extreme cold out, and then resume it again, maybe by February, mid-February, early March, as again, temperatures kind of mellow out and become a little bit warm. Uh, still, that, that wet weather slugs do actively reproduce. And again, by summer, when it gets hot and dry is when slugs tend to kind of uh, go away, except for areas that you are heavily irrigating, then you'll still have kind of a uh, regular activity. So that's the sort of pattern of slug control that we recommend. Get a handle on spring and fall, which really helps to deal with the rest of the season. <clears throat> now, leave the leaves. Uh, when we talk about leaving the plant material that has fallen off of plants, I mean, again, if we think about it, natural cycle of a deciduous tree, a deciduous shrub, the foliage is not going to be able to endure the winter conditions. Uh, so to avoid like freeze problems and frost burn and, and other kind of issues, the leaves fall off so that the plant can kind of go into a stasis or dormancy period through the winter. They are doing all kinds of things internally, changing some of their chemical makeup to have more sugars in the in the cells of the plant material, which avoids freezing. If they were just full of water, of course, if it froze those cells would freeze. So changes going on shows us the changes in colors and then eventually the plant drops the leaves. It's trying now to kind of harvest whatever it can from the leaves while they are still attached to the plant. So it's taking in sugars and carbohydrates that the plant has manufactured, kind of, uh, stop production of things like chlorophyll and that's why the green starts to slowly go away. And once it's recycled as much of the material as it can from the plant, material, plant itself, then it drops the leaves. And then the cycle is that those leaves are meant to slowly break down or decompose around the base of the plant, further nourishing the plant with its own decomposed, you know, plant material. And we have the last little bit that the plant had saved for recycling, Often the following spring, we come back with something in a bag or a box and replenish the nutrients that we have removed previously. Now, if we ask ourselves why we remove that, in most cases, it's a cosmetic or aesthetic reason. Um, perhaps you've got pressure from HOA or CCNR rules, so you've got those types of maintenance issues, <clears throat> or maybe you again kind of you know, the neighbors are all blowing and raking and getting rid of their leaves and you don't want to be the only uh, leafy landscape on the block. There are, I mean, honestly, we're all going to be changing some of our general concepts of what a landscape is for, even what home landscapes can do to benefit not just me and my family, but my immediate neighborhood and the community at large. And leaving the leaves, the idea is that not only, of course, the pollinator garden that we've worked so hard for this season, the moths, the butterflies, and even in a lot of cases, the bumblebee or solitary native bees are lurking 
and wintering over within that leaf litter. So butterfly larva is in the leaf litter. Bumblebees are hiding just below that uh, layer of leaves staying dry and warm. Ladybug that you maybe purchased this year to let go in your garden to fight the good fight on your behalf. Ladybugs will winter over under leaf litter to come back next year and you don't have to buy them again if you don't you know, evict them this season. So <clears throat> knowing that these beneficials, of course, in the leaf litter, there's obviously also pests. I mean, I'm not, you know, it's only good guys that you end up hosting in your leaf litter. However, we also have the benefit of songbirds and many of them being uh, ground feeding insect eaters that you know, cycle the food web is present in our gardens if we are leaving those leaves to preserve the habitat to feed up the food chain. So there's a you know, good reason on its own in addition to the fact that it really is the natural cycle that benefits the plants in the long run and reduces your need to bag it up in a plastic or paper bag, send it away in a fossil fuel burning vehicle who picks it up, if it goes to a municipal landfill, uh, landfills themselves bury the leaves and take much longer for them to decompose in a landfill situation. Now, if you're going to a city composting facility, the composting facilities do tend to break down those leaves much faster. But again, uh, the you know the impact on the the bigger scheme is all that you've sent it away and you're bringing probably mulch or compost back in the following season when it could have again just been accomplished on site. <clears throat> now your lawns and grassy turf areas do not want to sit all winter long under a thick wet heavy blanket of leaves. <clears throat> so it is not a uh, a whole blanket statement of just leave the leaves everywhere, wherever they fall, leave them there. First off, on sidewalks, decks, driveways, uh, public rights of way where there's lots of foot traffic, by all means, move those leaves into landscape beds or shrub beds and get them off of surfaces where people are going to be doing a lot of foot traffic. Wet fallen leaves, stacked up on top of each other can actually become extremely slippery and can become a safety hazard um, right up there with you know ice uh, for example so it's very important that we you know make sure that safety of ourselves our families our neighborhood um, is is definitely number one beyond that the heavy, thick, and the bigger the leaves you know the more they kind of tend to mat into just an impenetrable layer where now sunlight can't get down to feed and nourish our turf grass. So once you've got a blanket of leaves over your turf grass, you might as well have just turned the off switch on the sun, which uh, definitely is not going to help your grass grow. So we don't want to leave that heavy thick blanket on turf. <clears throat> if it is possible, to allow the leaves to dry up a little. They tend to shrink some. Um, I know good luck getting leaves to dry up now that the rains are here. But you can also use something like a mulching or shrinking lawnmower to mow over the leaves that are on your lawn. And that will shred them up into finer particles which will allow them to fall kind of down below the grass into that kind of thatch layer or closer to the soil. A pretty good rule of thumb is if you can't see your plants underneath the leaves, you should probably pull some of those leaves back. So that goes also with evergreen shrubs in your garden, evergreen perennials in your garden, things like our beautiful hookara or the gorgeous winter blooming hellebores. We don't want them to be completely uh, engulfed in a you know mountain or pile of leaves if the plant goes completely dormant like a winter hosta or your dahlia once the dahlia goes dormant, you certainly pile leaves on top of a dormant perennial 
but it's important that by spring you pull that back and expose the new plant. Uh, don't expect, uh, you know, to make its way out of a pile of leaves. Pull it back and you will have protected some of the new growth. Now, if you're going to pile leaves on top of something like a dahlia, by all means, a pinch of slug control under your mulch pile is going to go a long way. So a nice warm spot. A leaf pile on top of the dahlia, it's a great spot for a slug to hang out as well. So putting a little slug bait in there is gonna make sure that you haven't just kind of set the stage for like Airbnb snail and slug style for the rest of the winter. In, <clears throat> at this time of year, what to prune and what not to prune is often another one of the kind of big questions that people ask. We seem to want to go out this time of year and kind of just like take back everything that's grown in the season uh, to start with some sort of like baseline in our garden. Now, uh, it's better to do your pruning not at this time of year, but once the plants are completely dormant for the winter time. If you have interest in pruning in detail, go back a couple of weeks, uh, the last week in October, and you'll find a video on um, basic kind of pruning 101. We talk about tools and timing and techniques. The real uh, kind of, the real pruning is going to happen once plants have dropped all of their leaves and we're into when I prefer to then just put it off until it's not quite spring, but winter is mostly over. So I tend to go out and do most of my winter pruning or dormancy pruning in the month of February. You'll see on your handout what times of year to do kind of some of your basic pruning. Uh, prune in mid-February Japanese maples that are dormant. Lace leaf maples, bright maples, blueberries. Of course, I have a couple of high bush blueberries right here showing some of the beautiful fall color that you get on blueberry plants in uh, the autumn. But once they've dropped all their leaves, we can do some, uh, it's a good idea to do e at least every two years, a prune of your blueberries to kind of remove some of the oldest canes, the oldest growth, and encourage uh, air and light into the center of the plant and to produce good berries for next year, but lots of berries for the future as well. Most fruit trees, dormant pruning or winter pruning is excellent time for uh, pruning on fruit trees, although you can also prune them in the summer. You can, by mid or late February, cut back the kind of old foliage on hellebores, on sword ferns, plants that have really made it through most of the winter. I mean, they're evergreen, right? We have our native, I have a big, big guy here, our native sword fern. And this, many of us have at least, you know, one in our garden, uh, whether we planted it or not. And although a sword fern stays green through the winter and all of these leaves are going to continue to, um, you know, be there in snow and ice and whatever, they can get a little bit after they've been through a series of storms. Some of the leaves might have some brown or some brown on them. Some may dangle or have been broken. I think I have a broken one back here. And it's okay to remove the damaged, old, and kind of broken or burnt foliage before the plant, kind of late winter, the plant is, ferns usually are just about to put up a whole new batch of growth. And if you look down in the center of your plant, usually you'll see kind of these tight, bronzy brown tarantula looking, you know, curly, I don't know what we call them, the crown of the fern. And before long, it'll send out all new growth that'll replace what you've cut off. Same goes with hellebores. Many of us, uh, if you don't know about hellebores, you are missing out on a winter blooming plant. Uh, these are, there's a wide variety of hellebores that can bloom any time from December on through to even April, depending on the different varieties of hellebores. They're evergreen, they're shade or art sun loving, 
and the flower that comes up just barely holds its head up above these leaves. So again, because the leaves are there through the winter, they can end up with a little bit of brown or damage or blemish on them. And in order to better see the flower and keep the leaves looking fresh, right as you see the flower bud down in the, the plant, again, usually early or mid-February, depending on the variety of hellebore, then you can cut off the damaged leaves or anything that's obscuring the flower to really enjoy the bloom on its own. And once the plant finishes flowering, it will also send up all more leaves and new leaves for the season. So it'll kind of replace and replenish that foliage that got damaged. <clears throat> so what to cut back, those are some great examples. Mid-February, hybrid tea, floribunda roses, summer blooming clematis can be cut back in mid-February. Winter dormant, ornamental grasses, if you leave them up in the fall, February is another good time to get out and cut them back before the new growth begins in spring. An example of a winter dormant grass here on my, uh, well, stage right, I guess, would be the, this is a Penicetum and a Panicum and a Hakonicloa. So a uh, fountain grass, a switch grass, and a Japanese forest grass. And all of these grasses are starting to show some pinks, some yellows and oranges, and a little bit of their fall color, or oh, even burgundy on the switchgrass, because they're gonna to turn to straw for the winter. Now, different from some perennials that just melt away when they get to winter time, the foliage and kind of material stays above ground. So it's got enough like lignin in it that it stays up and doesn't melt away. And those seed heads of the little flowers are actually still uh, looking cute and in many cases still have bits of nutritious seed head in them for birds to come by and feed on. So uh, we are able to offer something to our area wildlife while we leave the grasses up at this time of year. I like to just see them with wind and even if we get a little frost, they hold the frost and the light is pretty behind them. And it just gives some sort of presence in the garden as opposed to cutting them completely back and there's nothing there. But again, in late winter or early spring, as new growth comes up around the base, it's much easier to take all of the old growth away because nothing above ground is going to kind of regrow. It's all going to push up new growth from the base. So then we can cut the foliage down to three, four inches tall, for example. And then new growth comes up and kind of re-greens the plant and fluffs it out and fills it out. And it looks great, uh, you know, within a couple of uh, months after growing in spring. <clears throat> Things that we, oh, and then evergreen grasses. I guess that's what my point was. Um, so evergreen grasses, things like, this is Carrick's Feather Falls. Other evergreen grasses would be um, blue fescue or the festuca varieties, um, blue oat grass, all the Carrick family, equisetums. <clears throat> this is our Carrick's testacea or orange sedge, another evergreen or I don't know it's really kind of like an olive orange so maybe it's never green but it doesn't die back or change in the fall so we don't want to cut these evergreen grasses back you can kind of just comb them and clean them up a little remove a brown or damaged uh, blade if you need to just kind of individually but we don't do the same just like chop it off at the ground level type of thing that we do for the winter grasses and another plant, where did I put it? Oh, up front. Another plant that many of us have in our annual gardens, and again, if you don't, you should, hardy fuchsias. So here in the Portland area, uh, we do have the ability to grow um, these wonderful garden hardy, ground hardy fuchsias. This is fuchsia magil magilica which is hardy to just zone seven where we are. Um, zero degrees, I think, is its uh, threshold, so it's not like you go down to temperatures or whatever. But if you notice, 
No, you wouldn't notice because in transport, I guess I took all the flowers off of them. But this just blooming. Um, in fact, there's, I left another plant out on the table that is still blooming today with a tiny little fuchsia kind of drop of flower <clears throat> that hummingbirds love. And this particular fuchsia can get to at least three feet tall and wide in a single season. So a big plant. It develops a little bit of wood, so it's got the look of uh, a semi-woody shrub. By the time it starts to die back in the winter time, it has above ground sticks that you see. <clears throat> and many people have the desire to want to go and trim back those above ground sticks as the hardy fuchsia dies back. Because that plant is right at the threshold of its hardiness zone. Here where's USDA zone seven and that's its limit. Cutting it back this time of year in the fall can lessen its winter hardiness. So what we like to recommend is let that uh, be a just leave it alone this fall. In many cases it'll bloom until December. Like I said, it's November and it's still blooming. So it might have small blooms into December feeding hummingbirds and our you know, bees that are out. When it's beginning to show signs of growth in the spring, little swelling buds and bits of green along the stems, then you go out and cut back anything that is above the green shoots that doesn't look like it's breaking dormancy or leafing out. The this type of delayed pruning tends to leave some of the plant material above ground enough to be sort of a buffer to freezing temperatures. And if it gets cut way back, it seems that then we risk potentially freezing out the crown of the plant and then we see death. Now, in many cases, it may not only sprout, the hardy fuchsia may not only sprout back from its own uh, sticks and stems, but it should and could also push a couple of bits of new growth out from the roots right around the plant too. So kind of look for those um, extended shoots, which will make it a bigger thicket over time. Protect and mulch. So, you know, this is uh, a lot of us know and keep again hearing about, we'll use mulch, you should buy mulch. Mulch is often a very confusing topic for gardeners. And I think that again, it's mostly because when we say, when a, when a garden center expert says mulch, we're thinking about this like dark colored, rich nutrient, earthy compost mixture to benefit the soil, to enhance the a look to um, hold moisture in but when we say mulch many homeowners think of this uh, reddish shredded or brown shredded or dark colored bark layer is on or blown on or poured onto the garden really more for aesthetic value of covering the dirt than anything else that mulch can help to weed control, but in many cases, bark mulch is not improving health or even, you know, uh, in many cases, takes nutrients away from the soil while it breaks down and then gives it back. So a little bit of nitrogen is tied up when we use bark mulch in our gardens. But mulch can be straw. I use straw in my vegetable garden as mulch. It's easy to put down, it's easy to pick up, um, and plants can easily come through it. The straw holds a lot of moisture, so it helps me keep my garden beds watered easily as well. In my landscape beds where I have shrubs and bigger trees, I use my fallen leaves as mulch. So in areas such as my driveway and my lawn, those leaves get raked off of those areas and instead of bagging them up and sending them away, I put them all around the mature plants in my garden to cover bare soil through the winter. 
And sure, it blows around a little bit and the leaves will blow around, but they tend to get caught by the shrubs and the, the trees and things in that landscape. So they do really tend to stay in that area and just slowly break down over time. Now you could also order wood chips <clears throat> from arborists in the area. And I give you on the link of getchipdrop.com or maybe woodchipsgetchipdrop.com is a free uh, delivery of arborist wood chips. It's again one of the um, excellent sources to use to mulch in more mature landscape plantings or around trees uh, or to even like uh, start to kill off grass in an area that you might want to plant next spring for example. So arborist wood chips are different from bark mulch in the sense that they are uh, composed of a lot of sized materials, sometimes small branches, both bark of trees and the inner wood of trees, and in some cases even leaves of trees. So the, it's not a homogenous uh, size material either, so the benefit of that is a little bit different. You could use compost, your own compost as mulch as well. When you mulch, you want to leave about a hand's width away from like clear of clear ground from where the plant uh kind of begins around so the crown that we call it or the trunk or the main stem so don't pile your mulch way up around the base of a plant rather leave it more around the outer perimeter of your plant where we would kind of consider the drip line or where the foliage is now in addition to as i mentioned you know the nourishment the weed control um, mulch also is an insulator. So when we talk about mulch in the winter, summer, when it's temperature related, we're talking about keeping the layer underneath, you know, the soil underneath that mulch layer in a more consistent temperature rather than allowing it to fluctuate with the you know sun and freezing and all of that which can encourage plants to like heave out of the ground and all that kind of weird stuff that probably people in the midwest have to deal with because of its insulating nature it's important to wait to do a heavy layer of mulch until we've actually had our killing frosts so that we're mulching in that winter feel rather than mulching a plant heavily while the temperatures are still mild and kind of delaying the feel that the plant gets that winter is setting in as the uh, you know temperatures slightly you know slowly drop in the soil. So here in Portland we typically have our first killing frost right around mid-November and so you um, are really safe in most cases to and mulch sometime around Thanksgiving or Thanksgiving weekend. Um, as I mentioned, that's a great activity to burn off some calories. So, uh, you know, if you're having friends and family over, order your turkey and order a mulch pile and you'll have your activity all set up for your fantastic fall time or nobody will ever have you host Thanksgiving again. Either way, um, you're welcome. Now, tropical plants, indoor plants they need to go into areas for protection well before our first killing frost so um, now would be a good time to go out there and start looking for things you um, don't suspect are going to make it outside and that includes you know dahlia. dahlias are one of those plants that you can either roll the dice and just let a dahlia be in which case sometimes it comes back in spring sometimes it doesn't Depends on the soil conditions, how cold it is, how wet it is, how well draining it is. <clears throat> but a little bit of late season protection and a pile of leaves or mulch over your dahlias can go a long ways to helping them fare better through the winter and return to spring. What I like to do is my, some of my dahlias are still actually flowering, which kind of blows my mind, but um, that's... I pinched them, um, I delayed their bloom. So I keep cutting, bringing them into the house because they don't do well with all the rain and they keep falling over. But as soon as it's gotten a good signal to go to sleep, the dahlia is going to 
you know, a good hard frost and the dahlias turn yellow and brown and start to just kind of die back. That's the time when I can cut it all the way off at the ground level. I usually leave a good two inches or so of trunk. And because I have dahlias that have rotted in the past with their great big stem, I use an empty tuna fish can or a cat food can. And just turn that empty can upside down over top of the stock of the dahlia and it acts as like a little rain cap or a, you know, a tin shed for the winter. Put a little rock on top of that and then a nice pile of leaves. And I still leave the stakes in for my dahlias just because I don't like to take the stakes out and put them back in. So the stakes remind me that there's dahlias there and that helps also to kind of get me to go out and pull that mulch pile and remove the can certainly by mid-April if not usually I do it by early April when everything is kind of getting tidied up for um, spring. So protecting various plants also just having uh, some like frost blankets old sheets and, and blankets available folded up and kind of in your garden shed ready to go out and toss over things that might need uh, a little bit of you know last minute protection for the season. You will see on your handout, I also mentioned dormant spraying, which is a, a wintertime activity that is best done on uh, roses, fruit trees, dogwoods, lilacs, uh, any real plant that has had multiple seasons of uh, disease or insect infestations that have been hard for you to control during the growing season. Applying a dormant spray is going to give that plant the best chance to kind of grow out next spring as clean as possible or, you know, in as kind of sterile of a start environment as you possibly can. If um, you feel like you might be a good dormant spray garden, uh, certainly come into the garden center and ask us about um, how to proceed and we'll get you all set up to go forward. The other tasks are really just kind of menial to do tasks, clean up and maintenance in the garden right now. We need to drain our hoses, uh, put them away. Uh, you know, if you cover your little faucets outdoors or wrap them up for winter, that's another good idea at this point. And have a, a watering can kind of near, maybe a bigger one than this, but a watering can nearby and ready to just be able to water plants as needed without uh, relying on your hose you know, store your hose for winter. Also, of course, if you've got above ground irrigation um, or lines, uh, drip lines, those need to be blown out or pulled up and stored for the winter so you don't have freeze cracks on those. And tools. I'm a horrible gardener with my tools. I leave them all out in the garden and some uh, sometimes, uh, so I need to like round up and collect tools that have been left out in the garden secure them. In some cases, they may have rust or caked on dirt. It's just a good idea to clean them off. You can use uh, steel wool to work on rust. You could oil them up a little if you wanted, especially like the handles. If you have wooden handles, give them a nice little treatment this time of year. Your hand pruners, another one that can be sharpened by hand, oiled up and ready for maybe the water wreath that you're going to make. So don't put those clippers completely away. And if as you're evaluating some of your tools, you find uh, cracked handles, wobbly uh, shovel heads, or, you know, crummy condition of pruners, this will be a great thing to add to your holiday gift list or your um, wish list for plans to purchase in the future. If there are more questions that folks want to ask in the comment section, I will be sure to answer them by later this afternoon. Uh, and hopefully this has been a, a enlightening session, either getting you off the couch to tell you that there are a few things that you should still be doing this season, uh, or giving you a little bit of a relaxed to-do list, taking some of your workload off and delaying it until, well, February maybe, or a little bit later. Again, thanks for watching as always, and happy gardening.